If any man tells you he went over the top and he wasn't scared, he's a damn liar. At the age of 111, Harry Patch, the last surviving soldier from World War I, gave strict instructions for his funeral. There should be no weapons on display. On his last visit to Flanders, to remember his pals, Harry said that war was calculated slaughter, and that the dead were victims of governments, and that the war wasn't worth one life. Then, with slow movements of his spindly arms and pallid blue-veined hands, he carefully indicated where some of the wreaths that he'd brought with him should be laid. Harry wanted them put beside the graves of those whom the British army had killed. When, aged 109, Harry had mischievously suggested in his crow-like West Country life-rattle of a voice that he'd give the presidents of quarrelling countries a bullet each for each of the foals to fight it out alone. The last living witness to the war to end all wars would stoutly declare that he'd no time for thieving politicians' lies. Dulce et decorum est, Harry repeatedly nailed the warmonger's vampirish fib, the great lie which so stubbornly refuses to give up the ghost, and he urged it to crawl back beneath its memorial stone and then die off. Harry Patch was able to give the vainglorious delusion of dying for your country a more derisive snort than even Wilfred Owen managed. For the last soldier in that so unheroic and so mawkishly mythologised war to end all wars had pricked the bubble of the whole unnecessary venture and with the sharpest pin. Harry Patch had never aimed to kill a single enemy, for he had none. The last hero undermined all war's empty self-regard with every breath he took, through ceaselessly deriding the fond fairy stories about how noble it is for a fresh-faced boy to flush his life down a muddy toilet of a trench, while bleeding and screeching with terror as he's thwacked by flying lumps of burning metal, so that, as war's shallow spin-doctors, and as the well-heeled, stately madmen of the political arena so persistently proclaim, others might be free. There was also more to Harry's thought than the soft-brained platitudes of peace and love. It was born of the bone. When faced at Passchendaele with someone coming towards him, coming to kill him, coming shrieking out of the smoke and cordite, their pistol blazing, Harry made a point of bringing him down with just a leg wound. As that German came towards me, and I can't kill him, I mustn't kill him. I can remember when I joined the army, I swore I would serve my king and country. And by some means or another, it flashed to my mind where Moses came down off Mount Sinai, a sixth commandment he brought down, Thou shalt not kill, and I can't kill him. I had about five seconds to make my mind up. I shot him above the ankle and above the knee. I brought him down. I didn't kill him. He'd always say with pride, and then, almost inaudibly, he'd reveal how, early in the war, he'd made his own small bid to end it, to end that war to end all wars. Harry'd made a pact with five fellow soldiers that they'd never kill a man, that they'd never kill a single enemy. The five of us were our little group together. And that's what worried me most, when three, four, and five were killed. According to King's regulations, their pacifist pact 
would have been a capital offence had Harry and his mates been discovered, and, ever afterwards, Harry would allude to it with a guarded chuckle, as if he could be arrested for it still, escorted to the regimental guardhouse, and even put before a firing squad, and shot, for his treason, nearly a century on. Just after the illegal invasion of Iraq, a real traitor, the then Prime Minister, Tony Blair, hoped to meet Harry, now becoming well known as the Last Tommy, with a view to his exploiting him in a photo opportunity designed to heighten Blair's own profile. After Blair effected the introduction, he edged towards Harry's wheelchair, then hovered beside him, grinning, as if attempting to absorb his stardust and even claim it, in some way, for his own. But unexpectedly, he met with Harry's sharp rebuff. Harry regaled him with the Harry Patch remedy for conflict resolution, namely that politicians who took us to war should have been given the guns and told to settle their differences themselves, instead of organising nothing better than legalised mass murder. Harry also told him that nobody during the First World War should have been shot for cowardice, as war is organised killing. Harry then looked up slowly at the embarrassed face of his now thwarted, lens-hungry predator, as he added with a rigid stare, and nothing else. Harry Patch had done what no war crimes tribunal has yet succeeded in, namely, to make the despised war criminal and profiteer, Anthony Charles Linton Blair, squirm, make his excuses, and scuttle off. Harry also thought that the nation's commemoration beside the cenotaph of its wartime dead was just show business. Instead, on November the 11th, on Armistice or Poppy Day, Harry would choose to sit, quietly, with a fresh glass of stout, a tartan blanket on his knee, and to recall each of his good friends, and how some of them had died. In his mind's eye, he'd see them still, standing and quivering, and then flailing like windmills, as they'd stumble and fall towards Harry through the mists of time. All I can remember is their nicknames. Baldy Allen, Jack and Jill. That's all I can remember. I wish I could. Harry would then look up from such salutary flashbacks to inquire sharply, What are we doing now that's really any different? Two civilised nations, English and German, fighting one another. Why? Those who came to visit the great man from the Ungreat War in his care home in Somerset would meet an amateur historian, keen on Arthurian myths, who'd spent his life as a professional plumber. An ordinary man, Harry was keen to make that plain, but one who'd plumbed a simple truth in an extraordinary fashion. There was no glory, not the slightest whiff of it, Glory's just gold leaf, he'd say. Passchendaele was mud, mud, and more mud mixed together with blood. He'd look up, his head at a frail, half-wounded angle, but always with a twinkle in ancient, limpid eyes, and wryly ask, if all wars end with people sitting around a table talking, just like we are now, then you'd think they could have done that to begin with without all the heaps of bodies in between. Harry had had the chance, like few others, to put war's inflated myth-making to the test and find it wanting, caused by a crude fault-line in the human psyche which Harry tried to patch. By way of a reward, should there be any kind of moral economy, Harry would gradually discover that he was living far, far longer than almost anyone, due, perhaps, to his talking life-enhancing sense. One rainy Saturday in Somerset, 
he closed his eyes for that distant, reassuring twinkle to find another home. Seated in his armchair, he slipped off with no showbiz fanfare, no medal for a final leap over the top into no man's land. The new no man's land, he hoped, would be unburdened by quaking, shrieking half-children and blazing bombs that mimicked a medieval hell and burning demonic bullets, but was instead filled with his rollicking mates, the fellow packed members that he'd kept faith with all his life, all now maybe joking with the so-called enemies whom they'd spared by nicking in the legs or winging. A gang of flightless angels, even. The pact's members and those whose lives they'd saved would now be joined by one who'd spent a 111 years as a living testament to the priceless virtue of none of it ever happening any more, if Harry Patch could help it. Harried buffed up the venerable motto of War Resisters International. Wars will cease when men refuse to fight. By his giving it the firmest possible shine, it had made him and his old friends greater than anything that had taken place in that so-called Great War, that serial enormity. The Great War is a chapter in our history we must never forget. So many sacrifices were made, so many young lives lost. So today, nothing could give me greater pride than paying tribute to Harry Patch from this the Somerset. This is a sad day, and it's a moment of reflection for our country. Uh, this is the last of a generation of heroes and courageous people who served our country in World War I. I was privileged to meet Harry Patch to hear... As soon as Harry's death was announced, every statesman, politician, royal panjandrum and military brass hat swiftly sidled into the limelight eager to use Harry for their own ends and squeeze him into the crooked jigsaw of their own inglorious agenda, namely, to rebrand war's moth-eaten romance, to give war's crass social engineering another retread, enabling it to carry on sustaining them in a self-important half-life, still wringing out the last drops of patriotic bloodlust from blood-soaked flags, as if Harry's soul ever had anything in common with militarism's tunnel vision, with its tawdry bling, or with the state's ungodly fanning of man's dysfunctional death wish. Each in turn would clumsily strive to glamorise Harry's contribution to a supposedly legendary war. What a man! What a testimony to the human spirit! What a towering example to us all! Cliché after cliché, was piled on top of Harry's corpse as mindlessly as a child slaps down mud pies. Private Harry Patch was the greatest living Englishman, the bravest of the brave, the last glorious survivor of that great war. The same phrases were zealously repeated with all the petty pride that conceited, posturing nationalism can conjure, while speaker after speaker after speaker studiously overlooked Harry's truest and most subversive quality, as if each one of them was desperate to bury it in the cold clay alongside his remains. Every single person paying homage solemnly omitted to mention what it was that Private Harry Patch had done. As the unmemorable ranks of all the dullest dogs of pomp and power's fly-blown ceremonial paid their enfeebled tributes to his loyalty and service, they'd ignorantly reiterate a claim which Harry'd never made, namely the patent falsity that Harry had fought so that we could all be free. And for the past four years, I've done nothing the talk of World War One. No, I want to forget it. But the irony was, the unique, the exquisite irony was, that the hero they were at such pains to appropriate, Harry Patch, their oh-so-patriotic and dutiful last Tommy, 
had never really fought in their accursed war at all. Their hero was a conche, a fifth columnist, a peacenik renegade. He never killed a soul. Harry had never fought in that imperialistic war, some so love to weep over in their cups, impotently grieving for a lost generation, for our brave lads who gave their all for king and country, to the surging pastoral strains of Elgar anthems. But Harry had refused to fight in that uniquely heroic war, now almost fetishized, a war that harsh reality reveals was engendered solely by trade rivalry. That war to end all wars was soon to be the cause of World War II. Then, thanks to all of that war's unfinished business, the cause of World War III, the Cold War, leading inexorably to four and maybe five and maybe more. Instead, Harried fought against all wars, self-replicating lies in the bravest way he knew, and, together with his friends, proved more courageous than any thoughtless, puffed-up killer. I picked up a piece of shale, about two inches long, half an inch wide, jagged edge to it, right in the groin. The doctor came along and he said, would you like me to take that shrapnel out? And the pain from it was terrific. And he said, no, before you say yes, we no anaesthetic in the camp whatsoever. And I said, how long will you be? He said, well, about two minutes. So I thought for a minute, I said, right, go ahead with it. And in those two minutes, I could have killed that bloody doctor. And to the last, Harry had fought not to have his shy and noble stature poached by crooked Whitehall kingpins, not to serve a compliant status quo, nor the dusty panoply of royal and military confectionery with their unexamined moral bankruptcy, all those who continue to give credence to other idiotic ventures, whereby more young lions are led by donkeys to their doom. On this, the 90th anniversary of the Great War Armistice, we welcome you wherever you may be as you join us here in Whitehall for this very special service and ceremony of tribute, commemoration, thanksgiving, commitment and prayer. This is a ceremony of tribute because we wish to honour those from many parts of the world who in a spirit of service and self-sacrifice endured the long and painful struggle of the First World War. Dress it as we may, feather it, daub it with gold, huzzah it, and sing swaggering songs about it. What is war, nine times out of ten, but murder in uniform? Douglas Gerald. <laughs>